this new technology that became known as the alphabet. So what this person did, uh, he could read hieroglyphics. He took different letters from Egyptian hieroglyphs for his alphabet. So he went through a process, apparently, of identifying every sound that he would make. So if it's me and you, imagine we're, we're, uh, we're talking and I'm listening to what you say. You make an ah sound. So I want a character that represents ah. You make a buh sound. I want a character that represents a buh. You make a guh sound, so I want a character that represents that, a duh, and so on. And so this guy came up with 22 characters that would represent every non-vowel sound that there was in his language in a language that Semitic people spoke. So some of the current scholarship that represents Christian thinking is arguing that it was the Hebrews that developed, or Israelites that developed the alphabet, maybe even, speculatively speaking, maybe someone even like Joseph, who was in a position of influence in Egypt, who had the motivation and so on. When you get to Deuteronomy chapter 6, you see that literacy is intended to be part of uh, Israelite culture because fathers are commanded to, to write on the doorpost of their homes. In order to write on the doorpost of your home, you have to know the alphabet and alphabet. You have to know how to write. You have to know how to read. And so somebody came up with this marvelously simple way in 22 characters to write everything that they needed to write, minus vowels. So it's super efficient. So like... Uh, if you look at the English Standard Version, say, of Genesis chapter 1, it's almost twice as long as the Hebrew version in terms of the amount of space that it takes. Because in Hebrew, you can write it not using any vowels. You can write it just with consonants, and it doesn't take much space at all. So all of Genesis chapter 1, that whole creation narrative, is communicated in seven parashot, or what's roughly equivalent to a paragraph. In English, it takes a lot more space to do that. So this individual created the original alphabet for a Semitic language using Egyptian hieroglyphs. And that became the form that Paleo-Hebrew took. So Paleo-Hebrew was the earliest form of Hebrew-specific writing that there was. Uh, the original scrolls were written in those characters. And it took that form and maintained that form until around 586 BC. And in 586 BC, something dramatic happened. Does anybody know what that is? Okay, some people say, some people raise hands, same what, thing as before. Give me the year again. 586 BC. Oh. Yes. You're talking about <coughs> the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar or the, the Babylonian, captivity. Babylonian captivity? So in 586 BC, the Babylonian captivity happened. So if you look at Israel on a map, you've got Israel, Judah. Above that, you have Aram, Syria. And then to the east, you have Assyria, Babylon. And so people were, they coveted the land of Israel because it was a bridge that connected, in a sense, a bridge that connected Europe, Africa, and Asia. So much so that sometimes people speculate that when the Israelites were being taken into a land flowing with milk and honey, that it's actually referring to the concept of the trade routes where people would take goods up through Israel. That's not my view, but it's a legitimate uh, idea. So you had what was called the Via Maris, which was the way of the sea, it went along the Mediterranean Sea. You had the Great Trunk Road, which went along uh, uh, the Jordan Rift Valley. So whoever controlled that area controlled a, a massive flow of goods back and forth. So that's one of the main reasons why it was always coveted by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and other people. And so just north of Israel, you had the Arameans or the Syrians. Uh, they spoke Aramaic, which is a cognate language related to Hebrew. Well, that language was important as a commercial language because if you wanted to go through that area and do commerce, you needed to know the language of commerce. And so the Babylonians adopted that and they used uh, Aramaic as a, as a commercial language. Well, they developed a formalized, stylized way of writing the alphabet in what became known as the square script. So here's how it worked. So originally you had guys, maybe a guy like David, when he wrote the letter M, you know, I, I write it with a Latin M. Well, originally, it looked like a wave of water. And the reason why is because there's a Hebrew word, mayim, that means water. So if you say ma for mayim, you want a letter that represents the ma sound. And so that ma sound was written with a wave of water. So in Egyptian hieroglyphs, you have that same uh, wave. 
Well, that was taken to represent the letter Mem or M in, in Hebrew. Uh, over time, it just developed. And so the original biblical manuscripts were written with those kinds of characters known as Paleo-Hebrew. Uh, uh, paleo the word Gimel, so you know the Hebrew alphabet a little bit at least, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Daleth, we know A, B, C, D uh, in English. So Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Daleth. Aleph was an ox. Beit was a house. Gimel comes from Gamel, which was a Semitic word meaning camel. And you can see the outline of the camel's head. Daleth means door and so on. So each one of those letters and the names of those letters represent something that was depicted by those original characters. Well, the uh, Babylonians needed something that was easier to teach, easier to read. So they moved from those pictograph style letters to something more stylized, something more like what you might learn in elementary school when you go to write. So every letter had to be uniform and fit inside of a box or a square. So all those letters can fit into a square in some way. So the old way from Mayan was uh, dispensed with for something that would fit inside of a square. So in the Babylonian captivity, they moved from those old pictograph style of letters to what we now know as the, the uh, Hebrew alphabet. It's referred to as the Jewish alphabet sometimes, uh, but it was not original to the Hebrew specifically. But the earliest form of that is depicted in a scroll that's over there. So in 1947, the oldest complete Old Testament that we had was known as the Aleppo Codex. So that thing dated to around 8960. So we had we took on faith that you know for that thousand years between Jesus and the completion of that Hebrew Bible, that things were not changed. And so theologically we had certain convictions, <coughs> but we couldn't prove it based on the evidence. In 1948, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, that changed a lot of things. And in that discovery, there was a copy of the scroll of Isaiah. And it was a complete scroll. And it pushed the dating back from AD 960 or so back to about 150 BC, 250 BC, somewhere in there. So it pushed the date back on Isaiah a thousand years. And so then we can take a look at the Isaiah scroll and see what changes were made. Very few changes were made. But the style of script that it was utilized, you can tell, is written with someone's hand. Whereas one of these that you see here, one of these more modern ones, by modern, you know, 500 years old only, 700 years old, uh, it's written with Hebrew calligraphic script. So if I write a grocery list, or I'm making myself a note for a sermon that I'm preparing, my handwriting is almost illegible except to me. <laughs> and sometimes it's illegible to even me. <laughs> so that's why you have an iPad, so you can, you know, do some time. If I write a letter to my wife, I up my game a little bit. If I'm going to write uh, something that's going to be viewed in public, I up it my game a lot because you know it's out there public, it's out there visible. Well, that's the difference between Hebrew calligraphic script and uh, a more stylized script. So our friends are the Orthodox Jewish scribes. They don't write like this when they write their everyday Hebrew. They only use this particular form when they're producing a Torah scroll. And they do that because they're trying to keep it to a certain standard. You know, it's got to be read not just today and next year or in 20 years. It's got to be read in 500 years if that scroll is still around. So they write at that level. And somebody asked a question a while ago, uh, how long does it take to produce one? It takes about a year to a year and a half just to produce a Torah scroll. So that's only the Torah. That's only the first five books. And they don't uh, use printing presses or anything like that because there's an engagement that happens. So here's what it would look like. When we go to church, we carry our Bible from home. You know, the pastor reads from it, we open our Bibles. But if you're talking about maintaining a certain tradition indefinitely, you want to make sure that people are very familiar with their text. And originally, Hebrew was written without vowels. So you can see a word, maybe it's got three letters in it, like my name, that's Brian. If you took out the vowels, you would have B-R-N. That could be brain, could be Brian, could be some variation of that. And you don't know how to pronounce it unless you know enough uh, English to be able to figure it out. 
Well, in a Hebrew Torah or a Hebrew Old Testament scroll, none of the vowels are there. And so when the reader is reading, he is dependent, in a sense, on everybody there to master the content of what he's reading. And uh, here's an example of the way it would work. I read an article where, in one particular synagogue, the person was up reading this reading the scroll, and he had a couple of people on the other side of them, and they're looking, and he reads something, and he reads it wrong. So he's reading aloud, and the people that are sitting out in the pew have to be able to listen and know if he's getting the text right. So they're dependent, they're in a sense, on the body of knowledge that they are maintaining. And he reads it wrong. And so they, if someone in the audience recognizes that, they, you know, they hold their hand up and they make them stop and evaluate the scroll, the condition of the scroll. So they got up and they looked, and there was a letter, I think it was the letter noon, which is like an N. If the, on the final form noon, if the leg gets too short, it doesn't look like that particular letter anymore. And so they looked at it, and they couldn't determine, is this letter legible or not? If it's illegible, the whole scroll is non-kosher until it's fixed. And so they're looking at it, is this a valid letter, what does it look like? And so the people that were looking all happened to have PhDs. So it was a, you know intellectual kind of a synagogue. So they're looking at it, well, here's what they did. They uh, said, who has a 12-year-old son? So someone, a young guy, you know, he's 20s, 30s, he says, oh, I've got a 12-year-old son. They said, bring him in. So they brought him in, and they brought him up, and they said, they tested him. Do you know the alphabet? He's like, yes. Can you, you know, they wanted to see if they could prove that he knew the alphabet. So they showed him some letters, and he could identify them all. So they said, yes. They said, okay, what's this letter? So he looks at it, and he says, that's a noon. They said, it's, it's kosher. Because if a 12-year-old can make out the letter, then it's still legible. <coughs> and so he went and sat that down. The, and that illustrates that they incorporate everybody in the community into the process of maintaining and transmitting their scrolls, uh, the content. And so it's a very sacred thing for them. I don't know that I own anything, have anything that comes from my father or my grandfather that has that sort of meaning. You know, maybe I can give my grandfather a shotgun one day. You know, that, that's about it. Or maybe the Bible that my grandfather acquired from you know, some store. And maybe there's, there's that. But we're talking about something that goes on for generation after generation after generation. And so if that letter had been illegible, they would have taken it away and not used it again until it was repaired. So they would have a professional scribe who knew the process for making exactly that letter, and he would re-ink that. So when a scribe produces a scroll, he does a, a panel at a time. And so we've got some uh, panels here. So after he's got the skin, he's got his ink, he sits down, he's got the original on his desk in front of him. He's got the, uh, repla or the new uh, uh, panel there. He looks at the first letter he's going to copy. And then he looks at the blank space. He looks at the first letter again, the original. He looks at the blank space. Then he prays. Then he looks at the original letter. He looks at the blank space. He reads it. And he makes that letter. Then he goes to the next letter. And he goes through this process for every letter. So it takes him about a year to a year and a half. And he can't work too fast or his scroll is going to be non-kosher by uh, just because of the speed he went. So he's required to go slow. So it's not about getting something done quickly. It's about getting something done right. And so all the rules are involved to make sure that he gets it exactly right. So he goes and he can only work a certain number of days on one because if, if he gets fatigued or if he gets tired, he might make a mistake. So when he gets to the maximum number of hours or if he's feeling uh, tired, he puts it aside until the next day. And so the regulations uh, make sure that he's really alert, he's really focused, he's not fatigued, and he gets it all right. And then when he's done, he has a reader that comes and reads it. So that reader reads it, and he'll know, each guy will know statistically how many errors he makes in the process of producing one. So maybe my friend says, I, on average, I make 167 errors for every 300, 4,805 letters. So he'll know this, and it's not leaving out a letter. It's getting the style of the letter, letter not correct. So he's writing in calligraphy, and he knows every angle of that letter, exactly how to make the crowns, 
and he's making something that's quite beautiful with a goose feather or a turkey feather with ink that he produced on a panel that either he or his uh, associate has produced for him. So this is the process that he goes through to make sure that he gets it all right. And when he's done, the next guy comes in, who's the reader, and he knows statistically how many errors that he makes when he corrects the text. So he'll know, on average, maybe I make 37 mistakes that I shouldn't make. So I'll miscorrect things. So maybe he looks at it the letter noon, and he turns it into the letter calf. Well, he knows that statistically he tends to make these kinds of mistakes. And a lot of these mistakes are connected to the fact that he has the text very close to being memorized, if not completely memorized. So, you know, he's reading along, and there's some passages that look similar. And it's when you have something memorized to that level, it's very easy for your mind to sort of go numb. You know, it's like driving to work. After you've done it for a few years, you don't think about the trip there anymore. You just sort of go automatically. Your car knows how to get there. And you can think about whatever, talk on your cell phone. You can do whatever you want to do. And uh, you get to work. And when you get to work, you wonder, how did I get here? I don't even remember the journey. Well, a person who's a scribe like that has that sort of familiarity with the text that his mistakes are related most often to memory or to mental lapses of some sort. So we're talking about guys who are super disciplined. The ones that I know uh, are people that I really, really like. Uh, they are the people of the highest integrity uh, because they're used to being focused on the details. In the New Testament, the way that scribes are depicted there is not a, is not a, it's accurate, but it's not pleasant to learn about, not pleasant to read about. I don't think that today's scribes are like the ones you read about, you know, that Jesus was engaging. I haven't met any of those guys. But, you know, we're also 2,000 years after the fact, and a lot's happened in the Jewish community in connection to the Jewish rejection of Jesus. So, you know, different sort of a situation. But if I'm with uh, one of my Jewish Orthodox sofa friends, and I'll just tell you a story. I told Josh and I tell this story. So a couple of years ago, and it's actually related to this stuff, uh, I was in Oxford, so I was invited to uh, the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies uh, at Oxford University. And the reason why that's significant is the oldest university library in the world is at Oxford. And it's either the oldest or the second oldest university, depending on you know, some factors. But they had the oldest university library in the world. And some of the earliest manuscripts that were deposited there were Hebrew manuscripts from Europe. So they've got the largest collection of medieval Hebrew manuscripts in the world. There's about 4,000. They've got around 3,000. So if you want to look at Hebrew medieval, medieval manuscripts, that's a great place to start. So there's a whole period between uh, you know, the end of Jesus and the printing press that sometimes we're kind of clueless about. Uh, what happened during a period of uh, 1,300 years? You know, the Bible didn't exist in English until it existed in 150 other languages in the world. So English was the last major European language that got the Bible. And that's sometimes shocking to people. But it existed in a lot of other languages. Georgian, Gothic, Arabic, Syriac, uh, Armenian, Ethiopic, or Ge'ez, uh, and a lot of different other languages before it ever showed up in, in English. So they have these really incredible medieval Hebrew manuscripts in, at Oxford. And by manuscript, we can refer to the Torah scroll or a codex. A codex basically is a pre-printing press book. We can refer to that. Or we can refer to a piece. So if you were to take a knife and cut a section out of one of these, uh, that little piece that you held in your hand would be properly referred to as a manuscript. So they have 3,000 of these at Oxford. And uh, this particular year, I was invited to go and look at them. So two Americans were invited, and every, there were 20 people. There was only one non-Jew that was there. That was me, and I was a Christian. So I get there, and uh, we, we get to the Bodleian Library. And in advance, we had to send in a picture of our passport. We had to send in a picture that was not a passport. And then when we got there, we had to show them the passport and then show them the original picture so they could match it to us. Then once they uh, take us in, we have to go through a lot of security. And then we go into this room, and we had to all take an oath, uh, essentially not to mess anything up or steal something. So we all take an oath, and the people there were from Moscow, they were from Tel Aviv, they were from 
um, Amsterdam, they were from Jerusalem, uh, all the sort of major places in Europe and in the Middle East where you, that are centers of Jewish scholarship. So like you know, used to in, in, in Russia, there was a really vibrant, significant Jewish community that was there. So we had a person that was from there. So we're all there together. And we get in our room, and we start looking at manuscripts, and we do this for, for days. And the world's specialists, top specialists in that field were the presenters. So I'm sitting there, and to my right is a lady who's the curator at the world's oldest, still-functioning Jewish library in Amsterdam. And then on my left, there's another person like that. There's a person from the library in Moscow. And there's a person from the university, I mean, from the National Library in Israel. So we're all sitting there. And uh, there were only two of us that actually believed in the content of what we were looking at. Oh my Me, the evangelical Christian, and my friend who is the Orthodox Jew. So they, most everybody else was secular. Uh, they, might, you know, they might believe in God, but not necessarily in the way that we tend to think of, of uh, the text anyway. So the guy who was the Orthodox Jew and myself, we became friends very fast which was a really fascinating experience since uh, he keeps kosher and I'm from Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we become friends and we, we still do things together. Uh, we went to Jerusalem, I think, uh, the next summer and spent some time with him there. And he's the guy that worked with me on uh, dating uh, Jonathan's uh, scroll earlier. So we do manuscript projects together and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. So. That's what it takes us to this, though, the Oxford connection. So during the medieval era, uh, the life of Jews in European countries could be complicated. And to illustrate that, in Spain, in the 15th century, the Inquisition happened, and the result is that the Jews were expelled from Spain. So prior to that, in, Jewish and Christian intellectuals were working together on the production of a great Bible. So, you know, you think of the 15th century. This is before the existence of English translations. They wanted to show uh, solidarity with each other, Christian and Jewish intellectuals. So they produced a Bible in Spain in the Castilian language. And it was known as the Alba Bible. So it was commissioned, it was produced, and it was an illuminated manuscript. And so by illuminated, it means it has colors. So maybe you th can think of like a, a family Bible that has these real wonderful colors that are in it. Well, these manuscripts, uh, they were books that were produced before a printing press. They were all done by hand. And this is in Castilian. And they're illuminated by hand. And so the gold that you see there is actual gold. You know, it's not some kind of ink. That's actual gold that's on there. And uh, you know, the colors are very vibrant. They're very exquisite. So Jews and Christians working together in Spain produced the Alba Bible in 1492. Wow. Uh, oh, before 1492. In 1492, the Jews were expelled, and they were expelled for 500 years. In 1992, King Juan Carlos I of Spain wanted to rescind that expulsion. But he thought, our Jews have been expelled for half a millennium. What in the world do you do to make up for that? And so they decided to do something special to commemorate the reverse. And so they said, let's go back to that Alba Bible, one of those last things that we worked together in Spain on to produce, Castilian translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Let's produce an exact copy, a facsimile, that looks exactly like the original, and let's do something with that. So they commissioned their friends. Uh, we have some, some colleagues that are based in London. Uh, they're called facsimile editions. They make, well, they made that Isaiah scroll that we have there. Uh, they made the fragments that we have there. They've made this stuff, most of this stuff here. But they can take something and reproduce it at such a high level that sometimes you wonder, is this the copy or is this the original? And it can take a long time to do that. You know, it takes years for them to do that. And so they were commissioned to produce this Alba Bible. And so they did. 
So at, at light speed almost, in just a very few short months, uh, at one third the time it should have taken them to do it, they made an exact repro reproduction of the original Alba Bible. And then for Juan Carlos's, King Juan Carlos's birthday, they brought the president of Israel over. And in a ceremony with the king and queen of Spain, the president and the president's wife from Israel, our friends, the Falters, pre presented each head of state with their own copy of the Alba Bible, their own facsimile. So it was a really special thing. And so in 1992, they reversed that expulsion edict and officially welcomed the Jews back to Spain. And our friends were the ones that produced it. And then uh, last January, they said, what do you need for your exhibits? I said, I don't know, what do you have? <laughs> and they said, uh, would you like some leaves from the Alba Bible? Because that's sort of one of their hallmark productions. I said, yeah, send us some of that. So they sent us these leaves, and you can take a, come up and take a look. Uh, it's monumental, not just because of the original translation of it. And it's monumental not because of the era and the illumination with the gold and all that. It's monumental not just because it was the last great thing that Jews and Christians worked together, intellectuals worked on in Spain before uh, they were expelled. It's monumental because the facsimile was reproduced to commemorate the welcoming of them back into Spain and the recension of that edict. And so they're our Jewish friends. We're Christians, so they sent us these so we could show them to you guys. So we have three of these from, uh, from the Alba Bible. They got their start with a Bible known as the Kennecott Bible. And it was a medieval, uh, illuminated medieval Hebrew manuscript, sometimes considered the most uh, extraordinary medieval, illuminated medieval Hebrew manuscript. And it was at Oxford. It was named for an Oxford um, canon by the last name of Kenne Kennecott. And so that Kennecott Bible was there, and over the years, only about 30 or 40 scholars have been able to look at it because it's uh, so valuable and so, so special. And so when I was there two years ago, they had the Kennecott Bible there, but they had four or five facsimiles around it. Now, I didn't know at the time, but our friends were the ones who were commissioned to produce the facsimiles of that Kennecott Bible. And it was their first project that they did back in the 80s. So they produced this thing, and it looks so much like the original that um, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. But they had, each one of them is worth a whole lot of money, just the, the copies. But they had four of those on the table by the original. We were able to examine them all together. There's a lot of value to having a, a facsimile, but we have one of those here. So that's a, a, a facsimile reproduction of the Kennecott Bible representing med medieval Hebrew scholarship at its finest. So we have one of those. We have some others, some other manuscripts. We have uh, a, a leaf from the Rothschild, um, I think it's the Rothschild Miscellany, I'm forgetting the name right now, of Psalm 1. So it's called, in Hebrew, it's called Tehillim. And so the first one is referred to as the Ashrei because it begins with the word Ashrei. So in English, we know, blessed is a man which does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. We know that, that, that passage. He was Ashrei, Ha'ish Asher, Lo Halach Be'azat Rishain. They gave that little leaf to me as a gift when we first became friends. I've got that one there, as well as a, uh, a couple of prints from the, um, from the French, I forget the name of that, North French Miscellany, I think it is. So, anyway, this is what this is all about. So that represents medieval scholarship, Hebrew scholarship at its finest. <clears throat> so back to the scrolls. So forever, there were no vowels in a scroll. But when the Jewish community was being disseminated all over the world, they went to Europe, they went to Africa, and eventually they got into the Americas, North America, Central America, South America, all over the place. If they didn't know how to read, they wouldn't know how to pronounce the letters. 22 letters all consonants, um, no vowels, so that means the letter, the language, the, the script rather, is an abjad. So consonants only. So imagine sitting down and trying to read a newspaper with no vowels in it. That would be a really fascinating experience. And so they're really committed to, to the process of interaction in the, in the context of a synagogue. Well, some Jewish scholars got wise to the difficulties of this. 
and the, a group of scholars called the Masoretes began developing a system where they could maintain the pronunciation of Hebrew words without changing the characters. So they developed a vowel system. And so like, uh, we have five vowels in English, A-E-I-O-U. If you're starting from scratch and you're thinking, you know, I, I know a lot of words that look similar but are pronounced differently, how do I avoid this problem? Like the word through, T-H-R-O-U-G-H. We also have through, T-H-R-E-W. We also have not through, not do, but we have do, D-O-U-G-H. And so we have those sort of variations, so the same vowels. So if you're starting afresh and you think, I want to avoid those kinds of problems, what can I do? Well, they didn't create five vowels, they created five vowel classes. And each vowel class has uh, a long vowel and a short vowel, or a long vowel, a long vowel, and a short vowel, but there's multiple vowels in each vowel class. And so they developed a way of keeping a text standard, but by putting in tiny little dots that represented all these different vowel classes. And they thought, we need to go further than that. How do we make sure that people know how to stress the accents? So they developed a whole system of accents, hundreds of different accents. So like if you look at a musical score, you can see an arrow that tells you to, uh, it, it says maybe, it says a, a note that says pianissimo or staccato or forte or something else. So the musical score itself tells you how to soften the volume or increase the volume or slow the speed of what you're playing on your instrument. Well, Hebrew has all that stuff injected into it because the Masoretes spent about 500 years working on this. So they developed the system, and there were a couple of dynasties of scribes who worked at this uh, for centuries to try and produce the perfect Hebrew Bible. They're not changing the characters, but they're adding the stresses and the vocalization and all of that. So they produced what became known as one of those, uh, well, there's, there were a number of them. And whenever they did that, they were called crowns because it was like a crowning achievement that took centuries to do. It was also a reference guide. So with those, somewhere there's a humash I've got laying around. Does anybody know where that went? It's a book that disappeared. I remember getting it out. Oh, it's in there. So this is a volume of the Torah, but notice it's not a scroll, it's in a book form. So the people who were the, uh, the scholars who were in charge of ma maintaining the standardization of the scrolls, they needed a reference guide that they could use to do that. So the <coughs> Hamash is a variation of Hamisha or Hamesh, it's a, it means five. And so the five books from the Torah are in this thing, and in it they have all those accents and all those notations telling the reader what to do. So the guy who is the professional could have one of these as a reference guide while he's producing a scroll. And that way, there are statistical notations, so if you see a certain letter, it, uh, or a certain word rather, it only shows up one time in the Hebrew Bible, it's noted. So there are all these different words, maybe a word shows up two times in the whole Tanakh, or the whole Hebrew Bible, it's noted with a little number. Maybe the word shows up three times, or maybe the form of this word is unusual. So like in 1 Samuel chapter 1, the word Shiloh is spelled one way, and in chapter 2, the word Shiloh is spelled a different way. So those two words are noted with those differences in spellings, and that would be similar to the way that Arkansas has been spelled over the years. You know, at one time it had a W on the end of it, and there have been other spellings. So words haven't always been standardized in English. Some of those words have different forms in the Hebrew Bible, but they're all noted. So when those guys get to a word, they have a notation telling them how many times it occurs in this form in the whole Tanakh. So they keep statistics on all that to make sure that they get it right. And that's referred to as the Mazora Parva. It's kept in Aramaic shorthand, and you would see it in a volume like this. This particular one is a parallel. It's got Farsi on one side and Hebrew with all the Masoretic notations on the other. So this would be like a guidebook. So these were called crowns, and this one has a picture of a crown on it. <clears throat> this one was uh, produced on a printing press. But before the existence of printing presses, crowns were produced 
very carefully over a long period of time. It's essentially an encyclopedia, you could say, on the Hebrew Bible in one volume. So it's really extraordinary. Well, one of those that was produced was known as the Aleppo Codex. So I think I mentioned that a little earlier. And uh, it originally was in Jerusalem. And in 1099, with the Crusades that happened, Jerusalem was sacked. And the community in Aleppo uh, got together a bunch of money, and they sent a representative who tried to buy as many scrolls and manuscripts as he possibly could. And he came back to Aleppo with a, a huge collection of scrolls and manuscripts. Well, one of these was the Aleppo Codex, and it stayed there for about a 1,000 years. So it was kept in a synagogue in Aleppo, in a vault, and there were two locks on it, and one individual who was in, uh, one of the elders had one key, and another elder had another key, and the guy who was the sextant was in charge of making sure that it stayed where it was. So it stayed there for a thousand years, rarely being uh, taken out uh, and, and studied. They were really protected of it. So just try to get your arms around that. You know, our church is 10 years old. We just celebrated the, you know, the birthday of our church. It's 10 years old. If we have one that's 300 years old, I don't know. Do we have any in the U.S. that are 300 years old? I don't know. But imagine one that's 1,000 years old, and you've got a Bible that dates back 1,000 years, produced by the greatest Christian scholars that have, have ever lived. You've got it in a vault. That's what the Aleppo Codex was. It was a crown. And it wasn't just a crown, but it was the crown. And then in the 1950s, um, actually before then, the 1940s, when, in 1947, when Israel was, modern state of Israel was created, the Aleppo synagogue was sacked, was destroyed, was set on fire, but somebody was able to save that crown. But once that was uh, sort of messed up, the next complete oldest copy of the Hebrew Old Testament was then one that uh, we, we refer to as the Leningrad Codex. It is in Russia. We have a facsimile of it. So a facsimile, again, is a reproduction. So Codex L, as we have it, is here. And it contains all the Masoretic notations, the stuff in the side, which is the Mazora Parva, the stuff at the bottom, which is the Mazora Magna. And our modern Hebrew Bibles will have that stuff, as well as the textual apparatus. So that's an example of a crown. The people that produced those were mostly from a group of Jews known as the Karaites. So you had two different Jewish traditions. One were the Rabbinates. They were the ones who put a lot of uh, stock into the traditions of the rabbis. But the Karaites didn't care about any of that stuff. They only cared about the Hebrew text itself, and that's the only thing that was authoritative for them. So there's a big difference between Karaite Jews and uh, the Rabbinate Jews. Well, the Karaites were the ones that were so rabidly committed to the text that they produced these copies, these crowns. Well, one of those, uh, well, in Yemen, there was a whole tradition of producing crowns. And they're known as Taj Tours or Keter Tours. Because Taj in Sanskrit and Farsi both means crown. And we happen to have one of those crowns, one of those Taj Tours with us today. Not a facsimile, but an original. And it's here on this little stand here. But in this 600-year-old manuscript, you have the Hebrew text of Scripture with all the Masoretic notations and accents. It's all handwritten. It's all created by hand. It's all there for you to look at. So the elite scribes that produced manuscripts were involved in the production of this. And to the side, you have the Aramaic text. So one of the early translations of the Hebrew Bible was into Aramaic. And so this we refer to the Aramaic, to the Targum or Targums, as a reference to that old uh, Aramaic tradition. And so you have uh, Hebrew and you have Aramaic. And uh, about 1% of the Bible is written in Aramaic. That would be like half of Daniel, uh, a portion of Ezra, and so on. So here you've got the Hebrew text in the middle with all the notations. To the side you have the Aramaic Targums. And in the bottom, during the medieval era, the language of scholarship for Jewish scholars was Arabic, sort of like in Western Christianity, it was Latin. For medieval Jewish scholars, it was Arabic. You have an Arabic translation at the bottom, 
in what's known as Judeo-Arabic. So it's written with Hebrew characters, but in the Arabic language. There's some other features too. Sometimes they contain some commentary and so on. But that's an example of how during the medieval era, they were able to maintain such a carefully controlled production when they made a scroll, whether it was from the Torah or from some other place uh, in the Tanakh. So that's what they were about. And in the medieval era, when we started to get into these manuscripts that are illuminated, there was cooperation sometimes between Christians and Jews in that. In some illuminated manuscripts, you'll have that picture. On one page, you'll have a Jew in, uh, in you know, his Jewish garb in the scriptorium, and next to him, you'll have a Christian in Christian garb, and uh, the Christian is doing the painting, and the Jew is doing the transmission of the text. It's really a neat thing. So there was this long history of partnership and collaboration between Christians and Jews, in Europe in the production of uh, their best manuscripts. So in a nutshell, that's what we've got up here. A lost track of time. Do uh, you guys have any questions? Yes? These uh, 4,000 rules that the scribes follow today and, and the formatting, and <clears throat> when did that become codified to this modern day approach? Like how far back can you trace like all the stuff that they went through when they copied the scriptures? Well, that's not my field, and so I don't know. I don't know how far that aspect of it goes back. But uh, we at least know from our study of the New Testament, the scribes were known for being fastidious, you know, with details. And so um, I don't know about the particular rules in the production of manuscripts, the whole history behind that, when it became codified. Anybody else? Yes. I have two questions. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, the Rabbinite Jews are basically uh, intellectual or spiritual descendants of the Pharisees, correct? Uh, from that kind of thinking, yeah. So our Lord would not, he would more like, it would be more like for our Lord to have been a Kenite, uh, if you Karite. will. But, uh, excuse me? Karite. A Karite, excuse me. A Karite, as opposed to being a, a, a Rabbinite. Yeah, totally. So when Jesus, remember in Luke 4, he stands up, he takes the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads from Isaiah 61, and he says, Today this passage has been fulfilled in your hearing. And he hands it back to the attendant, sits down, and all eyes are focused on him. So there you have Jesus relying on the text, utilizing the Hebrew Old Testament text as... Uh, um, as a form of apologetic, you know, as he's pointing to his own fulfillment of the law. So he had high regard for the text. You remember when he says that, you know, not a jot or a tittle will pass away till all is fulfilled. So he highly valued the text while uh, repudiating the, uh, the human tradition that had been uh, connected to all that. Yeah, he's at war with, the, with their tradition. Yeah. That's very clear from texts like Matthew 15. And Matthew's a Jew, and he's talking about this. Um, the other question I have is um, the Jews operating, medieval Jews operating with, you said Arabic, the way that Western Christians are using Latin. Are they using Arabic because it is a Semitic language uh, similar to Hebrew? Uh, partially, but some of it's geographic too. And so they're, they're based, uh, the land of scholarship in the medieval era for Jewish studies was Tiberias. And so that was an area, uh, an area under the control of Arabic-speaking peoples. And so, you know, you're there, that's, you know, it's like people who move here from other countries eventually, you know, if you're here long enough, you're going to, English is going to become one of your language, whether you like it or not. So there's that sense in that Arabic was the language uh, of that area, but there's also the reality that it also is a related language. An example would be... Uh, most of us know the term for God is El. Another one is Elohim, but another one is Eloah. A variation of that is Allah. And so in Arabic, you have a word that's etymologically related, and that's the term that they use for God. So you have that too. So their language is similar. It's very similar. It's a cousin to Hebrew. And uh, being that a lot of the sounds are similar, uh, there's a story of one of... The one of the producers of the Aleppo Codex 
who spent decades in Tiberias listening to how people pronounce the letter Rish. Because he was just trying to to understand how that difficult, you know, the letter Rish is akin to the letter R. It's a liquid, and so it takes different sounds or different forms when you pronounce it. Sometimes it's like an R, but sometimes it can become uh, guttural, like or, like that. So like uh, in, in Genesis 1 when it says, and God said, let there be light, in Hebrew, it's Wayomer Elohim, Yahi, Or. So that R sound, when it is after a long a vowel, takes on that guttural <coughs> sound to it, a guttural formation. When it stands at the front of a word, it's more like R, more like a Western kind of R. So this particular guy spent decades listening to the different ways that was formulated because he had to, they had to note how you pronounce that in the text with symbols. And so you have a certain letter in front of that R, that resh in the text that tells you when it's functioning this way as opposed to the other. So, you know, being in the land where Arabic was spoken facilitated that. Was, uh, so Arabic was used to, uh, I'm trying to formulate my question here. Uh, how is Farsi and Arabic used in relationship with the Hebrew, then, I guess? Farsi was also considered an intellectual language. Was it used in, in relationship to, like, like Arabic was used in the bottom of your, some of those Bibles there? Uh, was the Farsi used in a similar way? Okay, so I'm in, the, in the land of Muslims, uh, most of those countries are Arab countries, but not all of them. So you can be ethnically different and still be Islamic. So Farsi or Persian is a different language from Arabic uh, in the same way that other languages differ. So like when we speak English, that's an Indo-European language. If you, speak, uh, if you speak Spanish, it's different than Portuguese, although they're very similar. And so there are some of those differences that are sometimes et uh, impacted by ethnography and so on. And the particular crown that I, that I have, that Chumash, the other language just happens to be Farsi. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, six years, seven years ago, I was in a car accident, and uh, I broke, uh, broke my neck and my skull and, and some other things. And so I'm there and laying in the hospital, and a guy comes in, and he was my bone specialist. We call those ortho specialists. I think it was an ortho specialist. So he put my arms back together. He was from Iran and he knew Farsi. And so in the course of our interaction, we started talking about some of these things. And I took this Klumash to him because he was interested in hearing you know, about uh, some things from the Hebrew Bible. And so I asked him, I said, do you prefer the Bible or the Quran?" He said, not the Quran." I said, okay. So I brought this to him, and he didn't read Hebrew, but he read Farsi, and he could look at the two side by side in a parallel uh, Torah and read his language. The reason I ask is my son today is with the mission organization called Avant, and he's teaching, he's in the country of Georgia, teaching Iranians who have, who have fled Iran, teaching them Bible and theology. And he comes across, he's, so he's trying to learn Farsi himself, and I was just curious because of that, the connection that Farsi has with the Old Testament. And even the connection that George you mentioned that there were a lot of manuscripts that were that came out of Georgia, the country, not the state. Um, is that what you said earlier? Something about that's not exactly the way I said it. Okay. But it, uh, the Bible was translated into Georgian okay. before it was English. All right. Do you but, have any of those manuscripts here? No, no, I mean those manuscripts. Okay. I mean, there's hundreds of you know manuscripts in other languages. Right. And so you know there's the only limit. Uh, to what you can bring. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Question. Yes. Um, so the crowns are are uh, what they use to help um, help uh, pronounce the the, uh, the words, like to uh, I guess take the place of vowels. Is that something? That's like one of several things it does. So the crown, which is a a volume, it can be carried. So it's not kosher for use in worship. 
it contains the Masoretic tradition, part of which is the vowel system. But another part is a system of accents that tells you not only how to read it, but how to stress it. Like there are some nouns that the accent occurs on the first syllable. A shelleg, a word for snow. Uh, there are some accent or some words where the syllable is accented at the end. But all those accents are put there to tell you. So even if you don't know the word, even if you don't know what it means, if you know how that system works, you can pronounce it correctly. So once you learn the system, you can pronounce it in a way similar to uh, a Jewish rabbi in Israel, because you know the system. So that helps standardize its reading and pronunciation in synagogues all over the world, whether you're in Africa or in Argentina or uh, in Europe. If you know the system, you've got this, you can study from it, you know how to preserve that pronunciation. Because when you say something, you're communicating information. And you want to make sure, they want to make sure that information is not lost. And so the way they preserve it is through this elaborate system of uh, vocalization and accentuation. So I guess that's how I could come up with something similar to when uh, they said, well, you know, Yahweh didn't have any vows, uh, you know, and so they, part of that system helped them to come up with the pronunciation. It didn't help them come up with the pronunciation, but it helped them have something else to say. So in the tradition, they never wanted to say the sacred name of God. So this was connected to the, you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So out of fear that they might break that commandment, they just stopped saying the name Yahweh. And so when you get to the name Yahweh, you've got four letters known as a tetragrammaton. But what they've done is they've put the vowels from a different word there. And the vowels correspond to the word Adonai. And so when they got to Yahweh, instead of saying Yahweh, they would read it and they would say Adonai to avoid uh, pronouncing that name. So, you know, technically nobody really knows how to pronounce it because the vowels to preserve that pronunciation aren't there. Although you can uh, you know, extrapolate from the way other letters function when they're together like that what the pronunciation should be. So they say Adonai. But in, in a worship context, they don't even say that. They say Hashem, because Ha means the and Shem means name. So when they get to the name of the Lord, they just say Hashem. So they'll know that they're talking about the Lord without saying Adonai and without having to say the, the tetragram. So the Masoretes created the vowels about what time was it? About 980 or so? There were several systems that were vying for use depending on the part of the world, but the Tiberian system was the one that won out. And they spent about 500 years on it. So imagine 500 years perfecting the pronunciation and uh, the stressing of a text. And so, you know, here's a guy that this is his thing. He trains his son. His son trains his son. His son trains his son. And their specialty is getting the text exactly perfect. They're keeping their statistics. They have the text memorized. They know the text. They come across <coughs> a certain uh, combination of consonants. They know other places in the, the book where these consonants show up. So they keep their little notation in the side of it as a way of, of referring themselves back to that text. So they spent about 500 years. They were done by around 80,000. Uh, about 1,000 AD, right? Yeah, by the right. time that was all codified. And then. Um, crown. Right. So the creation of that and that all being finished and that's what they used was, you said, the medie medieval times? Was when? In the medie medieval period? Well, there were several crowns. Okay. And so let's say um, this school uh, believes itself to be the best at, I don't know what it, what it could be, biblical counsel. So this is their thing. They're going to work at that. We've got another school in California that they want to be the best at biblical counseling. So they're working on that. Then you've got some people in Philadelphia, Westminster. Well, they want to be the best at biblical counseling. Then you've got some people in Florida. They're working on it there. And so they're each refining their understanding of biblical counseling and producing their materials. And they know who each other are, but they're located in different places. So the guys who are producing the crowns were like that. They were each stressing the biblical text and trying to come up with a system of preserving it. And so there were a few different ones. And so more than one scribal family 
was producing what they hoped would be the crown. And so the crown of all crowns was from the Ben Asher dynasty, and it's known as the Aleppo Codex. Mm -hmm. That and time period on that would have been? It was done, uh, finished around AD 960. 960. And then all Jewish synagogues, even today, the Torah that they're going to have and use, it's, it's handwritten. It's yeah, they're all handwritten like this. It's for worship, it is handwritten. Right. Okay. And it's a community process. Right. And so, you know, imagine your 500-year-old scroll is getting to the point where there's a letter that's not legible anymore, which would be very easy to do. I mean, they're very resilient. Someone asked if we could take flash photography, and you can't, because with these items, they're so resilient. You know, they've got their formula for their ink so refined that uh, it's just uh, has a lot of staying power. So, but you get to the point where you realize we have read the Shema so many times, that whole panel is deteriorating. And one thing that happens is when you roll it and unroll it, the seam on the back side of the roll scrapes on the letters underneath it. So as you roll it, that seam is going over letters and scraping them. So depending on how much a scroll is used, that's a factor. But you get to the point where you're thinking, a 12-year-old can't recognize that letter and distinguish what it is. It's not kosher. And the expense of getting this back in kosher uh, status would be uh, cost prohibitive. But sometimes you have that. I read of a tour scroll that they spent 300 some odd thousand dollars restoring because of its uh, historicity. And then they donated it, uh, I think, to some organization uh, in Jerusalem. But so you get to a point, you think we need to replace this scroll. So either somebody from the community is going to do it, or you're going to hire somebody who's a professional, maybe who's known for his uh, extraordinary production of the crowns or something. Mm -hmm. So you commission that guy, yeah. and uh, he produces one for you. Yeah. Now, the, the panels, so those panels that are 350, 400 years old, um, what are the chances then that when you see panels like that, what's the chances that those were actually used in a synagogue? 100%. 100%? Yeah. So, so they were made, and you can look at them and tell if uh, the scroll was used, created for personal use or synagogue use. Most of them are for synagogue use. You know, you're not carrying a scroll around like to Walmart. You know, on my lunch break at work, you know, I'm not pulling a scroll out and reading it. Uh, although one time I was uh, on the 405 uh, coming up from the airport, and I looked over, the traffic was stopped. I looked over, and there was an Orthodox Jewish guy in the van beside me, and he had a Tanakh kind of like this, on his steering wheel. And he's looking at it. That's how slow we were going. And so he's reading. But if you're going to do that, it's not going to be a scroll. And nobody unrolls a scroll on their steering wheel. Well, I'm just wondering, what if you push on So, okay, after the printing press and then after printing became the thing mm -hmm. through years, then when you have these kind of handmade you know, manuscripts, that's what I was wondering, is, is it like... Is there a point where one is used for private use? Books are used for private use. Or hand done? Books are never used okay. in public. So, it, so any of those panels that you find, because I, I bought a few myself, mm -hmm. and that's what I was wondering, and they look just like those. Exactly. So I'm like, there's a chance though those were used in the cinema? Probably. You know, I'd have to look at it to tell you for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of forgeries you know, that go yeah. on. There's a lot of stuff for sale on the internet. It claims to be some Hebrew manuscript, yeah. and if you look at it, there are Hebrew characters there, yeah. but it's not uh, it's not legitimate Hebrew. Yeah. Somebody in the Middle East figured out this is coming from the Middle East. If it looks old, an American will buy it. Yeah. And there's a lot of that sort of stuff. Uh, somebody sent me a picture. Uh, a well-known individual sent me a picture of a manuscript that someone gave to him. He said, "What do you make of this?" And so I'm looking at it, and it's got like a verse from one of the psalms at the top and a verse from one, a different psalm down the side. And at the bottom, it had combinations of Hebrew characters that are nonsensical. Mm -hmm. So it formed no word. So whatever it was, it was a cheap production by somebody. Yeah. 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 So you know like even the mezuzah that you see, the mezuzah? Uh, a real one is produced by a certified scribe. And so he's a, a sofer stand, which means he works, uh, he's certified to produce the, the mezuzah text as well as uh, the, the other ornamental kinds of uh, 
uh, scripture that they would have in scrolls. Yes. The Leningrad Codex and the Masoretic Text, would that be the same thing? Yes. So, uh, all of these actually are the Masoretic Text, but none of them had the Mazor. So, the Masoretic Text refers to the consonants. And so, that's a particular tradition. What, the, what you're probably thinking about in terms of the Codex, the Masoretes went further, <coughs> not just with the standardization of the consonants, but with the, uh, uh, the, the information that they recorded in the margins and below the text. So the, Mas the uh, Leningrad Codex contains the Masoretic text, and it includes the Masora. Most of our translations today come from the Masoretic text, right? I mean, yeah. pre-1948, like King James Version, things like that. That's my understanding. All that stuff comes from the Masoretic text, too. Yeah, which is really the Leningrad Codex. It's, it's, a, it's a manuscript, right? Yes, it's, this is a facsimile of it, so this is what it looks like. But the Leningrad <coughs> Codex and the Aleppo Codex are essentially the same thing. There's some subtle differences in a a couple of letters here and there. I forget what all the differences are. But they're still both the Masoretic text. But the ones that we're translating from that to the King James Version, <coughs> they didn't have the Aleppo Codex. Yeah, I don't know what they used, but that would have been the Masoretic text as well. And the ones that predated <coughs> that are referred to as a Proto-Masoretic text. And so like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so you're going back before Christ, you have three traditions that are there the Proto-Masoretic text tradition, the uh, Septuagint, of, I mean, the, the tradition of the LXX, and you have the Samaritan tradition. So you have those three different tra traditions represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, you know, you're, you're talking uh, six, seven hundred years before the Masoretes came into existence. So the material they worked with predated their own scribal school uh, by far. Yes, Jonathan. Where does the Sinaiticus Codex come in relative to the Leningrad? Is it somewhat a few hundred late years later? So Sinaiticus is from uh, like the fourth century. Okay. Uh, Codex L is uh, 1000 AD 1008. But we're also talking once Greek right. and once Hebrew. Right. One contains the New Testament. One is from a pure Hebrew tradition. Yes. Of the Masoretes come into existence around 900, 1000 AD, correct? They started coming into an existence around 500 AD, 500 is when they began. It took them half of a millennium to get it worked out. Oh, that's what you were talking about. Okay. So they actually start about 500 AD. So um, I'm told that. So our Lord is, and, and the, the Jews of his time period, when he's standing in the synagogue there in Luke chapter 4, and he's reading from the Isaiah scroll, um, is he reading from a Hebrew text? He's reading from a Hebrew text that was probably not as old as the great Isaiah scroll that we have replicated here. So what is this about the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, written by the scholars there at Alexandria, the 70 or so, um, and the reason why our New Testament, when it quotes from the Old, is different, uh, not drastically, but there are differences between what you're reading in the way of an Old Testament quotation uh, versus what you're reading uh, when you're reading the Masoretic version. Okay, so imagine, on your bookshelf at home, you've got the ESV. You've got the NASB. You've got the KJV. They're all English. What the Septuagint was, was a translation of the Hebrew into Greek. And so you had Jews who were comfortable reading Greek, and that's the tradition that they would go to, that Greek tradition. But when you represent one language into another, to get that there, you have to add words or take away words in, in order to render the, the same idea. So like uh, in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is a grammatical marker there that identifies the direct object. 
we don't need anything in our language to identify the direct object. But in, in uh, Hebrew, it's Berashit, Bara Elohim, Eit Hashemayim, what Eit Haaretz. That Eit is showing that the next word is the direct object. So there, in that particular construction, you have two direct objects, Eit Hashemayim, the heavens, what Eit Haaretz, and the earth. So it's showing that there are two things. It's cosmological in nature, the heavens and the earth, which shows the totality, the totality of what God created. That's everything. We put that in English. Our grammar doesn't require identifying with the word what the direct object is. It's by the order of that word. In Hebrew, you can rearrange the order of the words to communicate other kinds of concepts. So the two languages are sufficiently different that when we render that into English, we can't put eight in there because it's irrelevant to an English reader, so we use our equivalent. So when you translate Hebrew into Greek, which is more sophisticated than English, uh, like there's 24 different ways to spell the word the, so you know how the word the and the word it goes with is functioning in the sentence, that's something that's that uh, heavily dependent on cases, and Hebrew is not, uh, it can create a lot of challenges. Like uh, there was a psalm, uh, just read about it, a particular verse in one of the Psalms, I think it was Psalm 96, I forget. I just wrote about it, so I should remember. <laughs> in Hebrew, there's six words, but the KJV translators use 22 words to get those six into English. Because uh, Hebrew can change the meaning by the way you pronounce it. So, like, uh, you make subtle changes to the way you point a word or the way you pronounce a word, like the word ketail. You can hear it's kind of intense. You hear the stress on that second syllable, t. Well, the same word is katal. One means he killed, the other means he slaughtered. So we use two different words, kill and slaughter, to translate that one word based upon how it's pointed or spelled. So we, you know, we have some challenges. And when it was translated into Greek, to get Samuel into Greek, they had to cut it in half and have 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. When they got uh, Malachim, kings, into Greek, they had to have 1 Kings and 2 Kings. So you're talking about doubling almost the amount of space it takes to represent those ideas in another language. So when you have that quoted in the New Testament, obviously there's going to be some differences. Does that make sense? I brought my King James Version with me, and later you can show me what you're talking about when you're talking about the 96th Psalm. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a link to an article and you can take a look at that and it talks about it. I don't know Psalm 96 for sure, but it's one like that. So That way you can take a look at it and think about it and kind of work through it a little more. So, is Luke, for example, using the Septuagint to quote our Lord, reading the Isaiah scroll that he's, that he's reading in Hebrew? Is that what he's doing? Uh, it could be that. You know, if you have a, a variation, uh, you know, if Luke... What's his ethnicity? He's a, a goyim, he's Gentile. Okay, so he's not Matthew. So when you read Matthew in Greek, it looks heavily Semitic, because Matthew is a Semitic thinker. When you read Luke, Luke is not writing with, from a Semitic perspective for Semitic readers. And so he looks more Greek in his orientation. He won't necessarily, like Matthew, won't necessarily quote the entire passage in Zechariah where our Lord is writing uh, Zechariah 9 where he's writing into Jerusalem. He'll only cite just the just one part of that verse. Is, is he doing that because he knows that his readers know the, the whole text? Is he doing a shorthand? So now I have to get into the psychology of that particular biblical writer. Uh, I don't know if it, he expects his readers to know it, or it's part of um, um, some other motivation. And I suppose we'd have to do a case-by-case -case evaluation of what he was doing. We'd have to go back to the Greek and look at it. We'd have to go back to the Hebrew and look at that. We'd go back to the Aramaic maybe and take a look at that. And there's a lot of different things we could do to try and narrow down what's happening. Is it possible to find an English translation <coughs> of the Septuagint? I'd like to find one. Uh, probably. Sure. I, I bet you could find one on Amazon. <clears throat> you can get a Septuagint, and there's more than one. Just like when we talk about the Masoretic text, we're talking about different traditions of the Hebrew text. There's 
a, a whole field of Septuagint criticism where there's not just one Septuagint, but there's multiple ones. And the same thing happens with the Latin Vulgate because over time the Latin Vulgate is you know, copied uh, this geographic location and that geographic location, some alterations are made. Same thing happened with the Septuagint. Yes, I think there's a hand over here first. Yes. Um, how does this uh, discussion we've been having in the last few minutes relate to our reading of the NIV, which is a thought for thought translation more, and the numeric standard, which is more word for word, and the ESV, which I think is Okay. <clears throat> so that's a discussion related to translation methodology. And so that has to do with the goals that that translation team has for rendering the translation into English. So the translators of the NASB, their thought might be, I want to have a word-for-word -word translation even if it's hard to read in English. And so, uh, for example, in, uh, in any given psalm, you might have a device referred to as a chiasm. A lot of people have heard of that. That's where you have something like a verb, subject, and an object. And so Hebrew, with one word, one verb, can communicate verb, <coughs> I'm sorry, subject, action, and object all with one word, which is you know, really extraordinary. So you can communicate a lot of information with one term. So what a Hebrew writer might do they may have a chiasm where they have subject, verb, object. In the next line, they'll have object, verb, subject. And so they're doing that to introduce a new section of poetry. Well, in English, we don't put the object in front of the subject. You know, I ate the fish. If I say the fish ate I, completely changes you know, what we're talking about. You know, suddenly, I'm being eaten by the fish. But Hebrew can, can switch that and do things with its verbs so that emphasis is communicated even though the object maybe is coming first and you want to stress the subject or something. So there's a lot of uh, dexterity with Hebrew that you don't have or of a different nature than what you would have in English. <clears throat> so the NASB translators, they might want to say, let's have as word for word literal translation as we can and still make it readable. And you may have a, what is it, the Phillips literal translation, where they make it word for word and it's, you know, you're not going to spend any time reading that because it doesn't make sense in English. Whereas the NIV wants to make it not only understandable and readable, that is more of a, um, more of a concern than the word for word component. In the ESV, it is uh, the translation of evolution. You know, when it first came out, it looked one way, and then every other, every year and a half, a new edition comes out, and then another edition comes out, and so you never know which ESV you're talking about. And then finally, a couple years ago, there's like a standard final ESV, and that's the one you go to, and the finished product is a pretty good one. But it went, they, and they heard it into production, and then revised it, and then revised it, and then revised it, and so the most recent one is a good one to go to. <coughs> was any of that helpful? Uh, yes, it was very helpful. <coughs> this particular discussion um, bears a lot more to this specific aspect because this is where we live on day to day basis, the people in the <coughs> Okay, so what was the point? You said this discussion bears a what? Well, just on, on a day to day awareness of studying God's work, just, just being aware of this, that. The, the different translation methodologies, you know, the, the goal, the, the translation actually has a goal. You know, the NIV is different from the NSB and the ESB. And uh, there are people who are confused about, about that. So they see differences and they think this is an issue <clears throat> of reliability, right. more so than a goal of readability. Uh, 
you see what I'm saying? It's just, it's probably applying this uh, on an everyday basis to everybody who talks to me. Just yeah. awareness of, of how language and transmission affects our day to day life. Right. It's one thing to faithfully transmit the text. It's another thing to faithfully render that text <clears throat> into another language, into a receptor language. That's a whole other different thing. And a good translation team <clears throat> will be able to look at the Hebrew text or the Greek text and not only capture something like a word-for-word -word equivalent, they'll be able also be able to capture the feel. So if it's poetry, they'll be able to capture that poetical feeling that it conveys. So... Um, um, they'll represent the feel, the smoothness, the, the impact in a way that's uh, comparable in the receptor language. But then as time goes on, the way that we use language, because it's living, it's alive, that changes too. So you can have a, a translation that emphasizes that become obsolete rather quickly. And, and the other thing is, is moving in our hearts towards just being in, in awe of the whole idea of communication and what God has done and all of this. Just in awe. Yeah. You know, if you look at the mechanics of speech, like if you, I think you can Google it, and it shows a human being from here up. All the different things that are involved in the process of communication are really extraordinary. You know, the way that your tongue hits the roof of your mouth and the way your tongue touches your teeth. You know, you make dentals. Uh, that's where your tongue hits the, your teeth and you say, duh, like a, a D or a b, which is called a labial, that's a letter, that, a sound that you make with your lips, uh, pa, ma, ba, uh, they're all made with your lips, and, you, and we don't have gutturals really in English, but some languages they do where they make it from the back of their throat, and just the <coughs> organs of speech, I said mechanics, the organs of speech that human beings are endowed with are extraordinary, you know, other animals don't have them, I sometimes try to get my dog to say something, <laughs> and I'll say, I can say, speak, and she has one, one word. She barks, and I'll say, use your words. <laughs> say ball. She says the same thing, rough. And I say, no, use your words, say ball. But she just can't manage to get her lips together <laughs> to say that. She's got teeth, she's got a tongue, she's smart, but she can't talk. Although I've had a bird before that uh, could really be interesting. Uh, but human beings are unique in that regard. And we are able to constructively invent and create new language and new modes of expression. Yes. Um, you know, it's always seemed like uh, the world is trying, always trying to discredit uh, the Word of God. And uh, on that program I was talking about earlier, um, they were trying to, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were saying that when they first found them, it was like a secretive thing, and, and they were kind of hiding it from everybody. And uh, the people that actually went through them and looked at them, that they they didn't know what they were doing, and they messed some of them up and all that type of thing. Um, that uh, I'm I'm thinking, well, that's fiction, and what they're trying to do is trying to you know make people think that the Bible isn't what it is, and we can't, like you said, it's not. Reliable. Well, that's actually true. They were discovered by a shepherd boy who threw a rock up in a cave. Right, yeah. And when he did, he hit something like that. Yeah. So I've got a jar there that looks like the jars the Dead Sea Scrolls were in. And nobody knew they were up there. They'd been up there a thousand years plus in a Geniza, which is a burial ground. So when you get down with a kosher Torah scroll, what do you do with it? I mean, it's a sacred thing. It <coughs> communicated the word of God to you, the mind of God to you. Uh, so they would bury it like a person. And so they rolled them up put them in a jar like this, put it in a cave, and the caves, did, the Qumran caves were the burial grounds for their scrolls when they got too worn out to be used. And so they put them there and they, they put them away. And a little um, Bedouin a boy was doing his work and threw a, threw a rock up in a cave and heard the sound of something crack, break. And that's how they were discovered. And so he went up and brought some down. The next thing you know, they're getting sold around because you know, people realize that these were worth something. And uh, there's a really fascinating, long story behind how the Dead Sea Scrolls finally came to light. But, you know, there's a lot of that that was going on. Jonathan? Just a couple of observations. You're talking about speech. 
uh, the late Tom Wolfe wrote a book called The Kingdom of Speech, in which he says that, that the actual piece of evolution that is totally different in the human is the ability for speech. And he talks a lot about how Darwin realized he too could not explain how humans got to be where they are, because he missed that idea. The other thought is that Bobby was talking about the, the difficulty sometimes of really knowing what you're reading and what the translation really is. And I say this out of some embarrassment that I haven't done the scholarship of learning enough Greek and enough Hebrew and Aramaic to read the Bible in original language. So I take the coward's way out and I use a lexicon. And so at least there, for instance, when Paul is talking in Corinthians when he says, you are saved. The Greek is that you were saved, you are saved, and you always will be saved. But we use one word, saved. And unless you look that up, that word saved, why Paul is using it there, and see that the Greek has all of those meanings, you miss exactly what Paul was trying to say in his Greek. So the only real true way to get to it, as close as you possibly can, is to get closer to the original, quote, original languages, which still aren't original. But uh, I mean, that's the, the thing we all face, is that our own lack of scholarship stands in the way of really making the most legitimate understanding of the word. Martin Luther said, be assured that no one will make a doctor of the, of the scriptures except the Holy Spirit of God. I think I butchered the quotation, but it's along those lines. Okay. All right. What's on the agenda for next? What we'll have is now. <coughs> Looks like something's happening. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a good time to break if you're ready.